thank you for tuning in. So let's begin with a centering prayer. I heard one of my colleagues share what we do in Centers for Spiritual Living when we pray. She said it in such a clear, simple way. She said, we move from the local mind into the non-local mind. Another way of saying that, we move from the egoic mind into this spacious field of awareness, an awareness that we all share. You could call it the infinite mind of God. And as we rest in that spacious, non-local mind, it's as if we've opened the windows of a house and we're letting the breeze of clarity blow through our thoughts. We still have a conditioned thought process from our past, but the more the windows are open and the more we disidentify with the separate self of me, the more clearly can this creative field of awareness flower within our experience. It is as if we share the same breath, the breath within the breath, the breath of God, the breath of spirit. We notice that we're breathing and that it's not us really that's doing the breathing. The breathing happens on its own. If we were in charge of it, we'd probably screw it up. But the fact that the breath breathes us, then we can have faith that that breath will be there as long as we're in this incarnation, as, in, as long as we're in this form. The breath will support us and breathe us and remind us that we're all sharing the same oxygen. We're all living on one planet, that we're all one people. And in this awareness of oneness, by its very nature, is a celebration of diversity. Oneness doesn't talk about otherness. It doesn't talk about lesser or greater. Oneness celebrates diversity. So allow your heart to open. And as Jody so beautifully did in this revealing service, she said, allow yourself to be embraced by your neighbor and for you to embrace your neighbor. We're talking metaphorically. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself because in truth there's only one here. And so let us in our mind's eye see the police and the protesters embracing one another. It may be a stretch, but maybe not. I saw the police chief in Flint, Michigan take off his gun and march peacefully with the protesters for equality, for safety. So if one takes off their gun, maybe more will take off their guns when they realize that we're here to love one another, to hear one another, to see one another. And in this deep listening, we feel heard. The cries of the earth are louder than they've ever been. And they need each one of us to say, yes, I hear you, I see you, I feel you, you are me, we are not separate. And in that place, the potential and possibility of compassion and tolerance and kindness to flower within this human species is possible. I hear His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who says, my religion is kindness. And he says, if each one of us could be tolerant, accepting, compassionate, and gentle with one another, what a better world this would be. And so we rest in that field, knowing this field never goes anywhere. Sometimes we wander off, we follow a stinking thought, maybe we close the windows of our open-mindedness and we're narrow-minded for a while, but in a nanosecond we can fling the windows open. We can fling wide the doors of our heart 
and we can be in that spacious field of tolerance, acceptance, compassion, and love in a nanosecond. So we meet here this Sunday morning to have a conversation. To have a conversation with God, knowing that all there is is God. In that playfulness, we witness what arises. Embracing the beginner's mind, which by its very nature is open to possibilities. Through non-striving, everything is accomplished because we're not the doer. Life is unfolding itself just like an orchid would unfold its flower blossoms, not with effort, but with ease because it's its destiny to flower. In that spacious place, we feel gratitude and we let this morning unfold. So it is. So it's so nice to see everybody out there practicing their safe distancing, wearing their masks. I, I finally got my hair cut. You're all probably thrilled. It was getting very, very long. And my beloved husband couldn't stand it. So he was walking with his scissors, and he has a shaky hand, and he comes at my hair. Scared the bejeebies out of me. So he took me to the salon. I wanted to have Lee cut my hair. He's sitting here today, and I didn't see Lee in there. And so the first one that came, she, uh, she did it, and it was such a, it felt like a sacred experience. You know, a safe distance before we came in. We sat in the chair, which was sprayed down. We held our masks. I don't know how she cut my, my um, what do they call these, sideburns? Mm -hmm. I think she lifted the, 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 the thing and then did the sideburns, but, you know, and uh, I could tell she was smiling even under her mask. So it was a very pleasant experience. And what if we could bring the sacred back into everything? I got out my old church directory, the one that Jody prepared last year, and I was looking through the names of people I hadn't seen, and I ran into Susan Orr's name, and I thought, oh, I miss that lady. She used to come to classes. And we must have had an hour conversation on the phone. It was just like finding an old friend. And she's the one that reminded me that she had a vision of a house with open windows and open doors and the breezes are blowing through. And that metaphor came up in this opening meditation. Could we keep our minds and our hearts open during these times so that we can hear the cries of the world? This month I'm doing a, a theme and I think it's important to have themes that are relevant for these times. And I pass these off to my student, Lisa Ferraro. She has to be, for me to mentor her as she's launching into what she calls Soul Call Ministries. So I shared with her that I prepare talks a month in advance to help kind of create a scaffolding upon which to fall and to lead me, because they kind of guide me. And so she's following the same um, threshold, the same foundation. And the theme that I chose for this month was navigating the tides of change. And God knows, there's tides of change happening everywhere. I remember Swami Satchitananda says, you cannot stop the winds of change from blowing, but you can learn to set sail. Another way of saying it is, you cannot stop the waves of the ocean from crashing on the beach, but you can learn to surf. So what if we're learning to navigate in the best way any of us knows how? I listened to Richard Rohr, who's one of my teachers. Uh, he's a Franciscan monk. And he speaks truth in a Christian community in ways that would get most people thrown out of the church. But he says they kind of leave you alone if you're a monk and you're in a little monastery. And uh, there was a complaint that was sent to the Vatican, but it came back and said, oh, you little monks off on your Franciscan thing, you do your little thing. So he said, basically, he says they gave me permission to be who I am, even if it offends them. He would talk about things like panentheism, how we're in God and God's in us, that we have to get away from this old idea of God as a man in the sky. One of the people asked him, Richard, could you define the word reality for us? Because you speak a lot about ultimate reality, reality with the big R. And he said, well, for those of you in the Christian tradition, you might say, reality is God with a face. You've given this idea of God a face, but reality doesn't really need a face. But if you're going to play with the face of God, then realize that the face of God is everywhere. Wheresoever I look, I see the face of God. You know, I have this one-eyed pug who is so damn precious, because, and maybe because he went through 
the herniated disc, that I just look at his face and I see the face of God. He's got that one eye that's still there. And Bert licks it because he tends Humphrey's little face. And you know, pugs have seepage, they have seepage problems. When Jody and I took him to the emergency room, they say they're poorly engineered. God didn't know what he was doing when he made pugs. But nonetheless, He's learning to walk, even though it looks like a drunken sailor. And yesterday, Trey and I were wheeling the pug in, in Blossomwood, and this man was jogging, and he stopped jogging, and he said, well, that is the cutest thing I ever saw. And I said to him, well, I said, he's not in the stroller because he's privileged. He's in the stroller because he can't really walk very well because he had the herniated disc. Then this man tells me the story of Missy, his little dachshund, and he said, she had a herniated disc six years ago. And he said, for six years, he had to take her in and out to go to the bathroom. He, they got little wheels for her. And he said it was the most painful six years with her after this, this operation. And he said she, she made her transition this year. And as he was talking, I could feel the balance of the sadness of telling the story. But I did say, you know, the love is still there. He says, oh, the love will never leave. And then he said, I'm sure God's going to burn me in hell because I sobbed at her death and I didn't cry at my own mother's funeral. <laughs> and I said, you know, when you have an animal, it's like having a child. And uh, so we had that little encounter all because of a pug and a stroller and a man's remembrance of a dog who had a herniated disc, but he said, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. He said, her little brother, he died at 16 last year, and they had three to begin with. He said, we have one very old dachshund now. And he says, she's very needy and she clings to me. And I said, how beautiful. I said, you know, we all get what we need, and it's, it's, it's a dance. My friend Carol Carnes, she, she attended, a, I guess, a normal church service <coughs> where they do testimonials. And she said it was a very interesting service because the preacher said, does anybody have an experience of sadness they'd like to share? And this man stood up in the uh, congregation. And I'm, uh, the title, by the way, is A Conversation with Life. So I was thinking of conversations that I've had that are meaningful. So this man stands up and he says, my wife and I sold our boat. We've had it for 25 years. All our kids were born and raised, taken out on that boat. Some of my fondest memories. But he says, we got too old to be taking care of the boat. So we finally sold the boat. And with it, it was one of the saddest moments of my life. So after that finished testimony, then the preacher man said, does anybody have a story of joy out there? And the same man stood up and he said, I sold my boat. I'm so grateful. I was driving that thing around. And so the irony is, could we hold this non-dual perception? These are the best of times and these are the worst of times. That's the very opening line of A Tale of Two City, right before the French Revolution. We're kind of going through a revolution here in America. The best of times and the worst of times. We were having a conversation earlier about police brutality, and, and I was, uh, had some bad experiences with the police in the past. But I'm grateful now that some of this is being exposed so that we can heal at a deeper level. It's important that we have the conversation. You know, I remember when I was studying Shakespeare in the Merchant of Venice, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. And Shylock, who was the Jew that Shakespeare was talking about, he said, if you cut us, do we not bleed? There's this idea that have a conversation around whatever it is that somehow we placed out of our heart and bring it into that place of communion, of, of conversation. Um, and to have a conversation with God. It's Ernest Holmes in The Science of Mind. He says little nuggets and they're little pearls of great price. One of the pearls that Ernest Holmes said is, always keep your conversation in heaven. Now let those who have ears to hear, hear. Always keep your conversation in heaven. Richard Rohr was asked by someone who stood up in the audience. He said, I have family members and on a political front we're at two opposite sides of the spectrum and sometimes they'll say things and they get me all upset and I don't know how to feel that. And he says, I get this question a lot. And he says, when someone says something that's so insulting to my intellect and I don't want to spar with them, I'll say things like, I'll have to think about that for a while. And then you can avoid having that, like when my little sister said that I needed to have aversion therapy and let go of my gay lifestyle, you know, um, or I was going to burn in hell. And I would try to fight with her and I would get scripture thrown in my face and I realized I'm not going to win this battle. At best we can have a detente. And so I found myself saying when she would say things that were very untasteful for my soul, like I might, you know, go to the 
place where people burn up, I would say things, you know, you may be right, but at least I'll be with some fun people. And, uh, and I try to just kind of pass it off and go on to another subject. But what if, if we dare to have that conversation, maybe we can build bridges instead of walls with one another. It's important that we learn to understand each other, that we take time to hear those who may be coming from a different place. So navigating the tides of change last week, I talked about listening to the voice of the world. And it's important that we listen to all the voices. I noticed when we have a president that says we have to dominate the streets, then I heard our military people saying, no, we need someone to unite us and not divide us. So could we say that there isn't a right way and a wrong way, there's just different ways of approaching it. Yes, we want law and order, but we also want people to have the rights to protest. I reflect, because I'm so old, not as old as some of you guys, but I'm pretty old, uh, when I was in college, and Richard Rohr talked about this, he said, everything changed in 1968, that's when I started college. You know, that's when you had Martin Luther King that was assassinated, you had Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated, you had the Kent State Massacres, they were shooting students on a college campus because they were protesting an immoral war. And they were sending us young men, and women I would think, to fight this battle. My brother-in-law was blown up in a helicopter one week into Vietnam. So I had a vested interest in, in peacefully protesting, but even then I was afraid with the police on the campus because I mean, they just had Kent State. It's important that we find our voice and that we stand up for what we believe in. Um, I have never marched in a gay pride parade, but other gay friends of mine that have say it is so liberating. When Trey was up in Maine one summer, they had a gay pride parade in uh, Portland, Maine, and he marched in it. And he said, I felt like I was standing up for my tribe, you know, that I have a right to be seen. Gay lives matter, black lives matter, Jewish lives, we all matter, every life matters. And so four-legged lives matter, you know, pugs lives matter, even though they're poorly engineered. And, and to have this kind of radical way of, of saying to the world that diversity loves oneness. Could we celebrate the diversity of one another? We're doing this wonderful class on Wednesdays, and if anybody wants to take it, I've got five books in the bookstore that I purchased for y'all. <clears throat> Some people get it on Kindle. It's difficult to get because it's out of print, so you have to order it from these roundabout places. But I love revisiting this book that I got in 1989 when it was written, and all the writers did it from an altruistic place. They wanted to offer their way that they have conversations with God. And it starts off with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who said, we should honor all the world's religions, but if they don't come together within a common thread of kindness, then maybe they're not worth their salt. And he says, be very careful that your religion doesn't become a doctrine, but that it becomes a spirituality of the soul. So could we find a spirituality that doesn't really need religion, and yet we honor all the world's religions? They're no longer a container that dictate how we should think, but they're a spacious home with the windows open where Hinduism can blow through and Buddhism wisdom can blow through and definitely Christian wisdom could blow through. <coughs> Richard Rohr was talking about the second half of life and I would venture to say most of us are in that second half and he said the first half most of it's about creating the somebody called me. In the second half it's about finding the soul that is so much bigger than the me person. You know, and his, his little book that he was talking about was a book called Falling Upward. And he talked about the spiritual path, not as a linear path with a beginning and an end and we're somewhere in the middle. He said, but the spiritual path is more like an ascending spiral. You, you go in and you go back. You're back and back. You expand it, then you contract. You think you got it, then you don't. You think you're lost. You feel calm and clear, then you have an anxious day. And he says, when you see life as this ascending spiral, then whatever arises is beautiful. We were teaching the class and, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, he said, yes, anger arises. But he said, if I lived with anger on my face, he said, I wouldn't be able to smile. And I thought that was his way of being humorous. He was uh, interviewed, by the way, on BBC World yesterday, and Trey screamed at me from the kitchen, turn on BBC World, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's there in Dharmasala. And he said, I've been here since I think 1959 when he was exiled as a young man from Tibet. And he, he's like a little pixie. And he says, I'm not gonna be around much longer. And he says, the Dalai Lama stops with me. And he says, people say, are oh, you gonna come back and reincarnate? He says, I'm not planning on it. 
So you're going to have to get used to a whole new paradigm. And of course he giggles and he says, there's one, only one Dalai Lama and you're looking at him. And then he giggled and giggled. And, and I thought, wow, what a simple little man, not to take himself so seriously. So what if in this conversation that we're doing with the infinite, it's saying, let's get into the second phase of life where it's not about me anymore. It's about this something that we all share. I was thinking about having this conversation with life and how we have intersections every now and then where we come across a divine experience, where the universe gives you this direct encounter with the divine. Jody reminded me that when she came to our center, we were down on Lily Flag Road, she walked in and there was the rainbow <coughs> connection being sung. And her little heart said, I know I've come home. Adam shared with me when he came, I was out of town and someone else was speaking and he heard something that he felt like he had come home. When I first stepped into a religious science church and sitting in the back thinking religion is the opiate of the people, I heard something and it was literally a thread that in myself said, I know this to be true. So the more I've given myself to this conversation with God, with the universe, and with truth, the truth unhides itself. It reveals itself from all the different voices if we have ears to hear. And each one has a unique experience. So I was telling Adam, one thing I learned from Louise Hay is everybody is doing the best they can with where they have. You know, Susan and I were talking about her relatives in Maine and how they're on divergent sides of everything. And, and yet we still love them. We can honor the diversity and say, that's your approach. I tend to see things in a different way. And in that, we're respecting them and yet we're honoring ourselves. We're not trying to change another's opinion. Have you ever tried to change someone's opinion? Wow, nobody wants it. So could we honor and let them be where they are and not try to influence them with our own uh, agenda? So let me get a little sip of water. There's this book that is inspiring me. I didn't bring it today. It's Mark Nepo's latest book. It's called Drinking from the Rivers of Light. And he starts this book off by saying, you know, all is light and all is love. And those rivers of light are expressing themselves through all the diverse aspects, through all of life, through all creation. Could we drink from those rivers of light? When I was talking to Susan on the phone, it's drinking from a river of light. And, and to realize that, that the, like, the reason I'm using this anthology for the love of God is because when I hear His Holiness the Dalai Lama speak, or I hear Matthew Fox speak, or I hear uh, Ken Keyes and, and Wayne Dyer there for this week, I hear my own self speak. They're pointing to something that's like sitting in the back of the Religious Science Center I'm hearing something I already know. Um, it was Matthew Fox. He started off his little essay and he said, when I was a little boy, I had polio. And he said, I actually knew what it felt like to not move my body. I was in an iron lung. And he says, and when I finally got the ability to walk again, I found myself living in so much gratitude that I have two legs. It completely transformed his life. And he said, it was then as a young boy that I gave myself to an understanding of God and he became a priest. Susan had a stroke, Adam had a stroke, changed their lives. First thing when I met her, she said, did you notice how it changed your life? The heart attack changed. So what if these things are not accidents, they're part of our destiny to have something that turns the table on this life. So Richard Rohr, he said, and I thought it was so helpful when you talk about the second half of life. And it helps me, this idea of navigating the tides of change. He said, in, in the church, and, I, and this is true for life itself, he said, the church, and he's talking about his Catholic church in his case, he said, the first, he said, there's three boxes. The first box is the box of order. It's the Old Testament. It's the Ten Commandments. And he said, if you, in Texas, if you go to any courthouse in Texas, they'll have the Ten Commandments there. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, thou shalt not this. He said, but have we evolved to, instead of having the Ten Commandments outside the courthouse, have the eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall know God intimately. Do we put that on the courthouse steps? No, we put the Ten Commandments. So he said, the old time religion and so much of the world, and he says more of the conservative element, want this order. They want the order, they want safety, what they've seen. But then he said, comes in the more progressives, and he says, they start creating disorder. They maybe protest the Vietnam War. They march for women's rights. 
They stand up for gay rights. So here's order and then there's disorder. He says, but what's needed on our planet right now is the third box. And that's, he says, I call it reorder. We need a whole new way of looking at things. And that's what I know is happening on the planet. My prayer partner from Canada says, I weep for you in America for what's going on. And I said, but you know, I see it as an opening. I have an optimist heart. I see that this is what's necessary in order for radical change to take place. When I left the center, center last Sunday, and I got in my little car, thank God I have air conditioning, and CNN popped up, and there was a little five-year-old girl with her father at a protest, and she was asking her daddy, are the police going to shoot me? And so here he took his little girl and he assured her, no, honey, we're peacefully standing up for Black Lives Matter. To have the courage to have that conversation, to not hide it anymore, to stand up for what we believe. I think that's happening all over the planet. And that's what I told my prayer partner. As, as, as troubling as these times may appear, I said, I think good things are going to come out of it. We're going to start listening to one another, you know, and, uh, and who knows what it's going to look like. So what was I going to go with that? So in, in, the, in the Rivers of Light with Mark Nepo, he talks about our capacity to have the conversation with one another. It was, it was the Buddha himself who says we don't learn from experience. That shocked me when he said that. He said we learn from our capacity to experience. So could we add we learn from our capacity to have the conversation with one another? You know, my... No, I probably shouldn't say that. I've, I've tried to have conversations with people about my um, orientation, and I, I told somebody that uh, they were left-handed. I said, I didn't know you were left-handed. They said, I was born that way. And I said, well, I like to think I was born this way as well. To which that person took their fork in their right hand and said, but I could change it any moment that I wanted to. And then I said, but I wouldn't ask you to do that. That would be mighty uncomfortable for you, wouldn't it? And that's as close as I got to having a conversation with someone who was projecting their idea of who I should be. And I don't know whether it was skillful or not, but it felt good. Because I didn't, I, I had the capacity at least to have a conversation. So Richard Rohr, he talks about order, disorder, and reorder. I was reminding Adam, in the Western world, we think of it as thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. Ernest Holmes was a synthesizer. So let's say the thesis is, you have this Christian Bible that we've all been given. Then we have this antithesis said, no, you're not born in sin, you're born perfect. You misinterpreted the whole thing. That's the antithesis. But then the synthesis comes along when Ernest Holmes said, the thread of truth was woven throughout if you have but eyes to see and ears to hear. The story of Adam and Eve is not about a literal man and woman that were the first man and woman on the planet. It was about the human race falling from grace when we moved into dualistic thinking, thinking this is good and this is bad. When we move into non-dual thinking, it just is what it is. So Serena Sage is in the class, and she's hopefully listening, and she sent me a text right away after last week's class that Jody and I did, and I talked about His Holiness the Dalai Lama saying that when I'm angry, you can't see my smile that's underneath it. And she said, are you telling me that I shouldn't be angry? She said, we just finished the true meditation class, and whatever you're feeling, feel. And she said, sometimes my anger is that righteous anger that's moving me forward, and da 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 It was this long text. And I said, you are right when you can inquire into the anger and you see what is the generator of that, then the anger has the potential to set you free. Underneath the anger, underneath the anxiety, underneath the fear is the light pushing through. So could we find the light in the middle of the darkness? That's the challenge for all of us during these troubled times. Could we see the goodness shining through the hearts of humanity? You know, could we love our neighbor as ourself? What he's saying is your neighbor is yourself. There is no you and me. There is only this one life revealing itself everywhere in diversity. I have this little sign in my beautiful gardens and it's from an artist and the sign says um, we are all flowers in this earth garden because human truth is one. No, we are all flowers of many colors in this earth garden because human truth is one. So to be so simple as to say you're a flower you know, Jesus spoke in metaphor, and he, he would say, be like the lilies of the field. He didn't say, be like Sol Solomon. No, he said, be like the lilies of the, seal, the field. Um, they toil not, neither do they struggle. Yet Solomon, in all his splendor, was not arrayed as one of these. So 
So he's telling us to live this simple life that's not complicated. I was talking to my prayer partner and he was sharing with me this morning. He said, you know, David, he's living on a little boat now, a sailboat in Vancouver Harbor. And his ministry ended last year. His relationship ended. He had several of them. And he said, I feel like I'm just coming out of a long depression. And he said, and be, having been a monk for years, he said, I had those vows of, of poverty and chastity and I don't know what the other one is, simplicity maybe. And he said, I feel like I'm still experiencing this, this sense of poverty. And uh, he said, I, I have to look at my conditioning from way back then. And then he told me the story of, of Sister Barbara. And he said he would, he would volunteer at a nursing home. And one of the ladies in the nursing home was a nun, once upon a time nun. She had left the nunnery 30 years ago. In fact, when she left the nunnery, she was in Calgary, she fled, she fled the nunnery in her habit. She had a little money stashed away. She got in a bus in Calgary and went all the way to Vancouver City. And she let the nunnery know that she's leaving the nunnery. The, the ladies in the nunnery said to her sister, Barbara, you need to send back your habit. So she, that's all she had, but she sent back the habit to the nunnery. Then another letter came to Sister Barbara and they said, you have to send back your ring because they marry you to Jesus. And she had this gold ring where she was married to God. So she sent back the ring. 30 years later, she's telling this story to my prayer partner as she's in the nursing home. And he said, she said, do you think God is mad at me, Terry, because I broke my vows to God? <laughs> And he said to her, Sister Barbara, he said, I still call her Sister Barbara. He says, do you have any money? She says, no, I'm poor as a church mouse. He says, okay, well then you've got poverty going. Um, um, do, are you having wild, crazy sex with a lot of men? She says, no, I, I, I don't have sex. So, well, we've got chastity going. He said, are you living a simple life? She says, they locked me in my room. I can't even get up. He said, I think you're, you're still married to the vows of chastity, poverty, and simplicity. He, t he told the story to the head nurse at the nursing home. She went right out and she bought a gold ring and she went and Terry put the ring on her finger and he said, I am marrying you back to your vows of poverty, chastity, and simplicity. He said, now that's a story. He heard the cry of somebody who felt that they had uh, not lived up to God's expectations. So what if we could do this kind of ruthless inventory on our own soul? Are we being integral in, in, in how we live our lives? Is it an opportunity for us to listen when spirit is speaking. You know, and it, and it, it, holds, it holds things in non-dual places. I love telling the story when I was in uh, Turkey with Gigi, and we, we had just seen the whirling dervishes in Konya, and we're in a big bus, and we're traveling across the land, and it's a hot day like it is here in Huntsville, and I hear Trey saying to me, David, whatever you do, don't look out the window. It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And of course, when someone says that, you look out the window to see the saddest thing he's ever seen. And on the side of the road, there was this old dog, skinny as a rail. And then there was another dog lying at its feet. I don't know whether it was alive or dead. And it, was, and it wasn't going to leave that dog's side. And whereas Trey saw something so tragic that broke his heart, I saw something so beautiful. I saw devotion that this animal will not leave this other animal even, even at the end. It's going to stay right there with it. So what if the capacity is during these times to see the beauty, even in the adversity, to see the potential and the possibility rising up? And sometimes it takes everything falling away. So Richard Warren, he gave us those three boxes of order, disorder, and reorder. And he said one of the nuns that he had, had a different way of saying it. She said, there is something sacred that arises. This is the paradigm. Something sacred arises. And then something, in the second box, something says no to that, you know? Like, all men are created equal. No, men, but not women, you know? There's something that, you know, the, the no place. And then she says, in the third phrase, the nun, she says there is a sacred reorganizing. This is what we need on the planet right now, a sacred reorganizing of how we see this planet. We have to recognize that this planet is sacred. I was listening to Jack Cornfield, and he's, in his meditation practice, he's been going to the coronavirus and saying, what is your message? This coronavirus is not an accident. There are no accidents. So could we learn to listen to the coronavirus? And as he was meditating on coronavirus, the virus spoke to him in his conversation with COVID-19. It said, we need to reform our healthcare system so everybody 
who needs help can get help. It shouldn't just be for those who are privileged, but for anyone. Huh, it's a leveling field. So what if the opportunity during these troubled times when we're in a little place of that sacred chaos is to reorder our thinking? You know, Jody was sharing how she was on an anxiety medication and when she stopped taking it, all of a sudden she feels things that she hadn't felt. Maybe it's time to get off the anxiety medication and feel everything. She had some tears this week. Isn't that wonderful? I can't imagine putting anything to keep the tears from coming because I cry at the drop of a hat. I can just see those dogs and tears come to my eyes. And there's something about having that open heart, that broken open heart, that makes life so real and so precious. There's a little book that's kind of like my Bible, and it's called The Gardener. And uh, Adam came up with a, a beautiful word today. It's not a word, but he called it uh, a soul orgasm. Soulgasms. This kind of gives me soulgasms, an orgasm for the soul, because it's this little gardener who has conversations with his garden, with the trees, with the flowers, and it's so intimate. And as I reflect on his having a conversation with the garden, I think of Emerson when I was reading um, Self-Reliance in that beautiful essay, and I read it in ninth grade and it stayed with me. He said, I look out my window and the roses out my window are perfect just as they are right now. Some are the rose hips that are the past roses. Some are the rose buds. Some are the petals wildly fully open. Some are the petals that have fallen, but it's perfect in every way. He said, but we humans, he says, we look to the past and regret what we didn't get or maybe bemoan something, or we look toward the future and when something such can, he says, but the rose doesn't do that. So here's this man who liberated my soul through his ponderings, through his conversations with life, and who did he have a conversation with but a rose bush? Does that sound like I'm crazy? Jesus talked to the lilies of the field. So, the gardener. He talks about the language of life. And here's how he said, it is time you were learning the language of life. He said it to his little student. So I'm gonna say you're all my little student to his little disciple. It's time you learned the language of life. And the, the, the apprentice says, the language of life he said, well, what's that? And he said, it's the language that the world which surrounds you expresses itself in. The way the rest of the universe communicates with you. How is the universe communicating with you? The universe is calling, are you listening? In the very beginning of the book, I was gonna do his first little taste on the mystery of life. And in his first little essay on the mystery of life, he says the gardener was exhausted and it was a hot day working in the garden. So he sat under the shade of the big pine tree. And as he's sitting under the big pine tree, tears are coming to his eyes as he's feeling this connection, his, the tree supporting him. All of a sudden, he sees a pine cone spin down. And with tears in his eyes, he says, thank you, old pine, for showing me the great mystery of life. That's the first little story about listening to life. So when is life speaking to you? And here's how he says it to his little disciple. The disciple says, I think I understand you, said the young boy. He said, with you I've learned to read the trees and the flowers and to listen to the birds and to feel the insects and to discover the hidden lesson in everything that surrounds me. Huh, sometimes nature, life, tries to speak to you directly to send you a message. He says, up until now, you've learned to listen to the voices of the beings that inhabit the world in which you're immersed. You've listened to their short stories, their wisdom, what they have learned. Now you have to learn to decode the messages that life sends you directly. Huh. And how will I know that this is life trying to tell me something, asks the young boy. And he says, you'll simply know it. The gardener answered him, there is something within everyone that lets them know that what has just happened means something, something important that one has to decode. Huh, this means something. And then lastly, he says, Coincidence, coincidences don't exist. And when something happens that calls your attention in that special way that it does, it's because there's a message behind it for you. There's something shining through. Something's trying to get your attention. Even the raindrops that fall have a meaning. So could we listen to the messages of life? And, he's, and then the boy says, well, how does one read those messages? He's 
perplexed. And he says, not with your head, said the gardener, but with your heart. The language of life is in some ways similar to the language of our dreams. It speaks in images that make an impact on your heart. Images like a house with open windows or lilies of the field that toil not or struggle. Images that create clear sensations and allow your mind to open up to a deeper understanding. A stork gives the feeling of good news of somebody who's about to have a baby, someone to be born. A wild boar promotes bravery and courage when someone sees it. A sudden storm carries away those already dead that are holding back the intentions of life. A soft breeze, perhaps, that suddenly rises in the afternoon and a calmness rushes over us, a sensation of a caress that has just been given to us by heaven. He says, when the heart is prepared to listen, then nothing happens just because it feels like it. And the boy says, I think I understand you, says the apprentice, but I would need time to be able to read clearly this language that you call the language of life. The gardener looked at him with only love in his eyes. And he says, you have all the time in the world, my young man. He says, make use of it. Open your heart to life. Listen to it. And the messages will become clear to your soul under the pleasant robe of silence. Huh, under the pleasant robe of silence. It's Eckhart Tolle that says silence is the language of God and everything else is just a poor translation. So to be able to hear the language of silence, Emerson calls it a mute gospel. Gospel means good news. And so nature is a mute gospel. In its silence, it's speaking such good news that we will get through this ordeal at the time. I take communion in, in my garden. You know, some people stop by and, and look at it. The neighbors come by. It's always preaching to me a, 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 a message of renewal, of death and rebirth. And each flower, each plant is so diverse. I mean, when someone calls one a weed, I, I go to the deaf and Emerson would say, I'm, I'm merely a weed by the garden wall. And what is a weed but a plant whose virtue hasn't been discovered yet? And so, you know, one man's weed is another man's treasure. There's a, a sweet bay magnolia tree. It's one of my favorite magnolias. It has heavenly scented, lemon scented, single blossom flowers. And she's not very common. And I've been growing one for 25 years in the garden. And this year, when the storms were blowing in February and March, she blew over. And so her roots were half out of the soil and half in the soil. And the boughs had fallen into another tree. And of course, being kind of a clumsy, I don't have Adam's strength. I tried to push it upright. Well, I wasn't, it wasn't budging. Then I tried to take rope and tie the tree to another tree to kind of keep her from falling further. It looked pretty awful. It was like trying to sustain an animal that was ready to go and take it. So I, I heard Jody, maybe it's time for this tree to see its next phase of its evolution. So I took my little hand saw out and I cut one big bough thinking I'll leave the other bough, but it looked really pretty bad. So then I cut the other bough off. And there was its root sitting there and uh, I wasn't gonna dig it out with it. So I just left it there. Well, wouldn't you know it that the life force said, I'm resilient. She's shooting out all these new branches from her roots and so instead of a big, huge magnolia, she's going to be a, a clumpy little sweet bay bush with hopefully sweet scented flowers that smell like uh, lemon tree flowers. And she's still there. So I go out and I talk to her. I say, you didn't, I didn't, I, I, I saved you. You get to come back in a whole new way. It's that you were in the ordered way, then you were in the disordered way, now you're in the reordered way. So what if she's preaching to me, this little tree, said there's hope for you. You think everything's gone and then life springs eternal. So let me just close with a little closing meditation with the gardener's inspiration. And know that life has never stopped speaking. The universe has never stopped offering its mute gospel to all of us. And so by lowly listening, we can even hear the smallest of things speaking to us. Sometimes I like to play what I call the God game. And I walk around nature and I say, I know you're in there, God. But I have to listen, not with my head, which wants answers and thoughts and beliefs, but listen with my heart, with my soul. Because the heart wants to find a meaning. And so what is that little sweet bay magnolia saying 
She's saying, I, I cannot die. I am life itself. The form will disappear. It will change. But what I am as life will not. And so each of us goes through times when the appearance looks pretty gloomy. But we hear Jesus saying, judge not according to appearances. So when I let go of what appears to be chaotic and disordered in the world, I get to know that there is a new sacred reorganizing happening at the same time. One thing falls away, but then another arises in its place. And could I know that it's a deeper, more loving, more inclusive expression of the one in its diversity. We are all many flowers of different colors in this earth garden that we share because human truth is one. That truth unveils itself in the open heart, in the awakened mind, in the jubilant and the beholden soul, in the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means to be humble, not to be arrogant. Poor in spirit means to be teachable, have a beginner's mind, uh, not to be an expert on anything. And in that I don't know place, there is something that does know. And could we surrender into that like Jesus did? I of myself do nothing. It's this power within that does everything. And in that lowly listening, allow that still small voice to smile in your heart, knowing that God's voice does not get louder but gets clearer. It'll speak to you from the tree, from the flower, from the rock, from the cut down tree where life springs eternal, from the birds that sing to you in the tree, not because they have a message to give to you, but because they have a song to sing. And we get to witness the beauty of that song. Then we're in a conversation that never ends, where we listen and we hear and we feel. Mm. I invite you in virtual land to say with me the heart salutation. Repeating after me, I honor you. I respect you. I love you. You are an aspect of myself. The beloved in me bows to the beloved in you. In this place, we are one. And from the heart of the one, I invite you to open your eyes to look out on the world with the love in your eyes and the light in your heart, lifting your fingers and letting that vibration ripple out to everyone in the world. The whole room is wiggling their fingers at y'all, so you're loved, you're seen, you're heard, and you're precious. Thank you for tuning in. So it is. <laughs>